what is up my youtube family welcome back to my channel if this is your first time here then just welcome to my channel go ahead and hit the subscribe button because you won't be disappointed today's video as you can tell by the title is going to be another true crime and makeup tale i'm drinking coffee today because it is super early i tried to get up before the geese but they're already up they're already up and speaking of the geese if you follow me on twitter i'm sure you noticed i posted this tweet that said geese one me blowing poppy zero and i forgot the mace y'all let me tell y'all what happened so i'm walking the dogs right my apartment complex is surrounded by a lake so i walk blue on the leash because if he's not on the leash he runs like a madman and poppy you know he ain't going too far he ain't doing too much by the way of cardio no way so i don't have to worry about him running off right poppy walks on further down from us no big deal he's not near a street or nothing it's good Except I noticed this one goose in the water on the other side of the lake. And so I'm like, okay, I'm looking at the goose. All of a sudden he starts swimming fast. He just like going so fast. And I'm just like, I know he is not about to run down on Poppy. Now Poppy is just, he minding his business, doing his business. When the duck reaches land, still I'm thinking, surely this duck ain't about to run up on poppy like surely this is not what this duck has come all the way across the pond to do poppy's still sniffing the ground not paying attention the duck comes up behind poppy and the moment i realize he is about to attack i scream poppy and poppy turns to look back then he starts to run the goose jumps on his back they tussle and both fall into the lake i'm screaming like a fool blue is looking like not even trying to help. Poppy and the goose go underwater. I'm running towards Poppy because I'm thinking like, I'm about to have to get down here and pull him out of the water. Poppy emerges from the lake, grabs onto the side of the mud and it's like really steep. So he's hanging on the side of the mud, clawing up the mud, sliding back down, looking at Blue like, help me, help me. After a couple of seconds, Poppy is able to get out of the water and the goose is just swimming around, like talking his noise. I'm gonna insert a clip of the aftermath because this duck just ran Poppy into the lake. <gasps> Poppy almost died. It was just a mess. The duck was still like going on and on and on. It's like, yeah, girl, you got this one. You got this one. And this is what really made me mad about the whole situation. Like, Poppy is the sweetest little animal. Like, he literally is the sweetest, sweetest little animal. It's like, like why would you attack him? You mother... So, anywho, that is what we've been dealing with on this side. It ain't over, though. And this was the one day I did not have my mace. Like, I don't even know if it would have mattered. Because we weren't even close enough for me to mace the goose before it attacked Poppy. But... I don't know. I'm sick of this. And I don't even know where these goose came from because they were not out here a couple of weeks ago. This is new. I'm sick of the things. Like, they obviously migrated from the hood and they need to go back. But you know what? I think it's that one goose because I noticed he was running the other geese away. Like, they would come near and he would, like, run at them with his wings up, hissing. It's this one goose and I don't know what his problem is, but... Something gonna have to give because I'm sick of his ass. This is literally the view of them right now. All of them standing looking at my window and that one circled in red. That's the one. That's the head goose in charge. That's the one that be attacking everybody. I'm sick of him. Anyway, let's get into the story. Today's story is probably going to be a really long one. So I need to get right into that. I don't know if I mentioned before that we're drinking coffee because it's early. I'm going to use my facial mist to uh, moisturize today since I'm using my Tatcha primer putty and you know how that girl likes to act up sometimes alfred griner packer was born in allegheny allegheny county i don't know how to pronounce it but i'm sure somebody is from there that's in pennsylvania he was born on january 21st 19 no 1842 so he's an aquarius i'm pretty sure somebody in the comments told me us aquariuses we don't do these type of things from this girl yeah you do. And in the last video, I got the I got the sign wrong. He was a Virgo, not a Leo. I corrected it in the comments, but I think some of y'all missed that. But anyway, I'm sure about this one. He's an Aquarius. Alfred was one of three children born to James Packer and his wife, Esther Griner. By the early 1850s, James Packer, he moved his family to LaGrange County, Indiana, where he went to work as a cabinet maker. 
that's cute honest living now little alfred did not have the best relationship with his parents and it's not clear if he was the issue or if they were the issue there was no reportings of like abuse of anything like that so he might have just been a rebellious teen i don't know but whatever the case in his late teens he picked up and moved to minnesota to become a shoemaker and just earn his little money on his own and do his own thing he was sick of his parents and so he wanted something different so uh he packed up and moved on april 22nd 1862 he enlists in the union army and he actually served during the american civil civil yeah, civil almost says civil war what is a civil war is that a thing eight months after he enlisted though he had to be honorably discharged because he he started having seizures apparently he had epilepsy and he would have seizures literally every two days. And so they had to excuse him from the army because they couldn't have him out there on the battlefield season. So after that, he traveled west and then he spent the next nine years doing odd jobs. He worked for a while as a hunter, as a ranch hand, a field worker. But unfortunately, he wasn't able to keep a job long because on top of the fact that he suffered from epilepsy and he would have these seizures, he had a terrible attitude as well. Like he wasn't that, he wasn't a likable guy. He worked for a couple months as a tour guide, but that didn't work out either because on top of his terrible attitude, he had a terrible sense of direction. He would take groups out and often get lost. And after so many losses, they were like, you know what? Your services are no longer needed, sir. We're going to have to let you go. After that, he decided he wanted to go be a miner and find him some gold. And um, after a couple months when he was not able to find any type of fortune doing that, he decided, you know what, this one ain't for me either. Just trying stuff. And I mean, I guess I can respect it, but you know, it's like, sir, you ain't good at nothing though. He just had bad luck and a bad attitude. All of the people that knew him, they recounted him being very quarrelsome, very uh, mean. He was known to steal and just all around hard guy to get along with. We probably all know somebody like that. And if you don't know somebody like that, you're probably the person like that. Now, in November 1873, 20 men, they left for an expedition for the gold fields of Breckenridge, Colorado. It was said that there was a lot of gold over there. And um, it was a great place for you to go mine at the time. People were finding good fortune there. The men were mostly strangers to each other, but they were, you know, they were down to team up and go get this gold strike. You know what I'm saying? Y'all, don't let me forget to blend this out above my lip because we know I will. <clears throat> 25 miles past their starting point into their little trip, the group, they run into Alfred Packard, right? Our homeboy Alfred. Aquarius Alfred. Alfred. You know what? I've been calling him Alfred. His name is Alfred. So this is the thing. I don't know what his mom and daddy was doing when they switched that in they are, but they did. And so if I accidentally call him Alfred again, just y'all, it's early. Okay. It's early. I'm so sorry. Alfred asked the group, like, where are you guys headed? Where y'all going? And they let him know about the gold strike over in Colorado. And so, of course, you know, he's out here broken these streets. Nothing is really going right. He asks the group if he can join them. And at first they tell him no, because he doesn't have, he doesn't have any tools. He doesn't have anything really to offer the group. Like he's just a broke stranger. Now, Alfred, he began telling the guys that, you know, I might not have no money and I may not have no tools, but I am a tour guide and I'm very familiar with the area so I can help you guys get there and find the gold now they see this as a position of worth amongst the group so they're like okay well you know you do have something to offer come on let's go come on vamanos everybody let's go they themselves really knew nothing of colorado's geography but unfortunately for them neither did alfred he was lying and so yeah now, as they're traveling together, now group of 21, Alfred, he didn't just sit down and eat his food. He was very greedy with the rations. He was very lazy. He was very troublesome with the group. He would start arguments and fights. I mean, just really being his, his himself. And so this, this became a problem for the group. He particularly did not get along with Frank Miller. They constantly fought. They constantly argued. 
remember that name, Frank Miller. His seizures also made his presence in the group kind of strenuous. Nevertheless, the group tried to be understanding, especially with his health. I mean, because the seizures really, they weren't something that he could help. But his bad attitude was. But anyway, the guys, they put up with it because they felt like he was going to be an asset to that team once they, you know, got to the Colorado area. Even though he was working on a nurse child, they, they just dealt with it. Alfred's shenanigans eventually, they slowed the group down. And when they realized that they were not making adequate progress and that the winter was vastly approaching, child, it was, it was coming. And it would have made their travels even more strenuous. The trail that they were following was becoming heavily snowed over. And so they began to have to rely heavily on a compass. Now at this point, Alfred's inexperience as a travel guide was beginning to show because it's like, okay, sir, we don't have the trail no more. You should be able to lead the way. Instead, you got us looking at this little compass and uh, this where you're supposed to be shining, my girl, but you're not. Thanks for reminding me to blend up a lip this time. See, that's why we friends. That is why we friends. Now, Alfred did not know what the hell was going on, which way to go, or none of that. So ultimately, the group becomes lost and agitated. They come to a standstill and food quickly runs out. The men are forced to live on horse feed. They take the food from the horses. And they were nearing the point where they were about to have to eat the horses. Let me know down in the comments if you taste the horse that they eat horse food from. Because me, I didn't know people ate squirrel until I made the video on Matthew Hoffman. And people were like, girl, we eat squirrel all the time. And I'm like, what? Really? My mother is not a game eater. She's such a picky eater. I didn't even know you could eat the thighs and the legs off a of chicken until I was grown. Like, that's how crazy of an eater she is. So, of course, eating squirrel was like to me now they didn't just want to sit around and wait to die so they started to move again and on january 21st they stumbled upon the native american tribe of chief Awe. i'm questioning it because i think that's how you pronounce it but i don't quite know and so you know how that go now this tribe was located near montrose colorado that area at this point the men are very desperate they're damn near dying and they are a little afraid and apprehensive to approach the tribe because they don't know what to expect. They don't know if they're going to be greeted and welcomed with welcoming greeting arms or if they're just going to be shot down with some spears and attacked. Before you get offended in my comments, baby, the Native Americans are my people, okay? Don't fall in the comments like, God, I don't want to hear it. Chief Awe, he greeted the group with open arms. He gave them food. He gave them shelter. It kind of, you know, he nursed them back to hell. He was a very welcoming and gracious host. He recommended that the group postpone their expedition till spring because they were likely to encounter like really harsh winter weather in the mountains and it wouldn't be safe. He warned that not even a local would attempt such a journey at this point in the year because they for sure would not make it in the mountains with the weather. Like... It was just no way. The chief offered for the group to remain with his tribe. They would provide them food through the winter, shelter through the winter, and then they could move on when the winter passed. He promised to share all that he and his people had with the group, which is so nice. The entire group, they stayed there for a couple of weeks, but unfortunately, a couple of them was ready to get to the gold. So they were like, you know what? I can't wait no longer. I'm gonna leave. Three men got together and decided that they probably could make their way on their own from there and that they weren't gonna wait because miners from all over the country were headed towards this gold strike and they were just fearing that maybe everybody was gonna get to it before them. They wanted to get on and get out of there because they was not trying to get their last and not get no gold nuggets. Now Alfred, he tries to leave with this group, but they're like, you know what? No, we're not taking your ass with us. Nah, fam, you don't have no money. You don't have no tools and you obviously don't have a sense of erection and you're a liar. So we're not taking you. They threatened to kill him if he followed them. And so he turned around and went back to camp. So Alfred decides he gonna make his own little group. And despite his obvious lack of direction, he's able to convince five men of the group to follow him out into the winter wilderness to go find this gold. The group of six men, they leave the tribe on February 9th. The men in Alfred's group had a 75 mile journey ahead of them, which they estimated would take approximately 14 days to complete. Now, Alfred, he took his group higher up into the San Juan mountains, completely disregarding Chief Alway's ominous warning that there was no way that they could go up there into the mountains this time of year 
here and make it out alive. The group goes into the mountains with two rifles, one pistol, a couple of knives, a hatchet, and minimal ammunition. So, I mean, they had a couple of things, but they didn't have much. What happened after they proceeded into the mountains is not clear. Roughly two months later, on April 16th, 1874, Alfred Packard arrives at the Los Pinos Indian Agency in Gunnison, Colorado. He is broke, he is freezing, and he is alone. All alone. The five-man group that Alfred had been traveling with throughout the mountains, they were nowhere to be found. Now, when the group is set off on their little journey together, everybody was alive, they were healthy, and they were well. But it seems that between that point and uh, Alfred reaching his old destination, there's something very, you know, something sinister had happened trying to build suspense here. Now, at the time that Alpha reached the agency, the men that worked there, they were all sitting around the mess hall. They were having breakfast, minding their business, just a regular old day. The door flings open and Alfred standing there begging for food, begging for shelter. He was carrying a rifle, a knife, a little steel coffee pot, and a satchel. A man purse. They rush over to Alfred. They offer him food. They offer him water. They sit him down. He's scarfing down the food like he's starving. He's vomiting as he eats because, well, I don't know why, but he was doing that. He tells the man that that was happening because of his prolonged starvation and that his digestive system had been altered because he hadn't had food in so long, just a twig and a berry here and there off a tree. Now, from there, the man offered him whiskey which I don't know how that's a good idea to go for a starving person whiskey, but they get a man a couple shots of whiskey, which he takes down and begins telling the man the story of his group of five men and how they started out as a group of 21, how they got to the Native American tribe that were helped. Then they decided to break off and pursue the gold on their own, except he told them that he had been hired by the five men to guide them to the gold. He then tells the man that one day he had gotten his feet wet while they were traveling and his feet froze, making him a lot slower than the others. He claimed that his lagging behind the group subsequently made him a burden for them. And so one of the group members, Israel Swan, gave him a rifle and then they abandoned him. They decided, you know what, girl, this is it for you. But here's a gun just in case just in case you need it. Alfred claimed that from that point he was forced to survive on his own and make his way out of the mountains with minimal ammunition and virtually no supplies whatsoever. He claimed to have owned, oh no, y'all done dipped into the wrong purple so we just gonna try to, we just gonna have to make it work. He claimed that all he had to eat was little rosebuds and twigs and berries. And there's a vegan joke there, but I'm not gonna make it because the last time I made a vegan joke, some people got a little upset and offended and you know shout out to the vegans my sister been a vegan for about four days now so i support y'all it's all love the men in the agency they listened to his story but this is the thing they had had people wander off from into the woods and stumble upon their agency before and the thing about alfred was for him to have been lost in the woods like he said he had been for two months he wasn't malnourished looking he wasn't all skinny now he was dirty he was dirty as all hell, but he wasn't skinny. He looked like he had been eating really good. His face was very bloated, very fat. His body was bloated as well. Homeboy was not skinny at all. He claimed that he had no money, and so he offered to sell the rifle that he was carrying to the general for $10, which nowadays is about 200 and something. He claimed that he was literally penniless, and he needed the money, and he was desperate enough to sell it for that cheap. And it's a good deal, so homeboy purchased it. Now, he stayed at the agency with the group of guys for exactly 10 days before he let them know that he had a desire to travel to Pennsylvania and, you know, just get back to his life. They advised him that there was a nearby town that he could go to to purchase supplies for his his trip back with his little $10. So he advises the group that he's going to head there. Now, when Alfred reaches the town, instead of going and getting him some supplies and heading on out, he makes arrangements to stay at a local hotel. The owner of the hotel claims that Alfred spent about $100 during his stay. Which, mind you, he said he only had 10 The $10 that he had from the rifle that he sold. The owner of the hotel also claimed that Alfred had offered to lend him $300 on top of the 100 that he had spent. He had spent $78 on supplies at a local store. 
And so it's like, sir, you way past this $10 you claim to have only had. People were also noticing that he has several different wallets, like a lot of different wallets. And it's like when he would run out of money from one wallet, he would pull out another one. And they were like, you know what, uh, mister, where are you getting all these fucking wallets from? But nobody said anything. It's just something that they noticed. He began hanging out at the different bars, drinking heavily, and he would often tell stories about what had happened to the group after they left the tribe. And every time he told it, it was a different story. It was never the same, the same story. All of this quickly led to a lot of gossip around the town, of course, because it's a small town. You have this guy that showed up out of nowhere, spending a bunch of money, telling a story of how he was a part of a six man group. And now it's just him. The story of how he becomes detached from this group. It, it just changes every time he tells it. I feel like a Ninja Turtle we disagree now apparently during this time a couple of the people who were a part of the original 20 piece i said it like they have had chicken nuggets child the 20 piece wow they were also leaving the tribe and traveling now a couple of them had begun stumbling upon the same agency that little old alfred had stumbled upon one of the first being a man by the name of Preston Nutter. He and two other men, they stumbled upon the agency together. Oh no, I'm sorry, not the agency. These three, they stumbled upon that town nearby the agency where Alfred was hanging out, blowing money fast. The group, they run into Alfred at a bar who's there drinking, drinking and carrying on, having a good old time. Preston, he approaches Alfred and he asks, you know, hey, where's the rest of the guys? Where's the group that you left with? Alfred tells him the story of how he got his feet wet and that they froze. And so he had to set up camp. And the group told him that they were going off to find food and that they would be back. He claimed that Israel Swan had left him his rifle just in case, I guess, a bear or something came out of nowhere or just in case he encountered trouble while the group was gone. And then they just never returned. He then tells Preston that after so much time had passed and they had not returned, he assumed that they had abandoned him. And so he was left no choice but to leave them to their unknown fate and uh, move along. That's what he did, surviving on twigs and berries and the occasional squirrel. And uh, luckily he stumbled upon this town and Preston, he thought the story was odd, mainly because of the same reasons that everybody else thought it was odd. It's like, he did not appear to be a starved man. He had a fat little belly and a full face. Furthermore, Preston thought that it was extremely unlikely that five people would abandon their guide and press on in the snowbound mountains that the guide claim to know so well. It just didn't make sense. It just didn't make sense. Preston also found it really hard to believe that these guys would really abandon him. He was like, these don't sound like my homeboys at all. I don't believe it. Furthermore, Preston didn't believe that Israel would simply hand over his rifle, especially needing it. Like, what if they ran into a good old tasty deer? What they gonna shoot it down with? What they gonna do is jump on his back and wrestle him down? No. Maybe it's not Ninja Turtle I'm giving. I think it's Barney. Girl, now that I've thought about Barney, I really am not pleased with my color selection for today's look. The group had a lot of questions for Lilo Alfred. They were like, girl, this is not adding up. Where did all this drinking money come from when Alfred was flat broke when he joined the group? He even claimed to have still been flat broke when he stumbled upon this little town which is why he sold the rifle for $10. $10 is not going to get you a room for wheat, supplies, and endless liquor. It's just not. Not even in Mexico. Preston also noticed that Alfred had in his possession a skinning knife that had belonged to Frank Miller, the guy that he was constantly fighting when they were all together and was one of the five men that he had set out with, which I'm surprised that he was able to coax old Frank into going out with him and joining his group when they couldn't even get along. I guess for that coin though, Frank was willing to get along with him for the time being. With the whole fortune being involved, I guess it, it makes sense. Preston asked Alfred how he came to, to have it. Alfred claimed that Frank had simply stuck it into a tree and then walked off without it. And so he decided, hey, if Frank don't want this knife, I'll take it. He plucked it out of the tree and they carried on. Now, Preston had doubts about Alfred's story from the from the beginning. But this 
really made him feel like, you know what, this this man is lying. Something really bad must have happened. Like he did something to the crew. You see, Preston is like me. This is the thing. One of my triggers and pet peeves is for somebody to lie to my face. Don't try to play on my intelligence, boo. Don't tell me no, don't tell me nothing stupid and expect me to believe it. Then I'm insulted. So uh, at this point, Preston begins to make accusations. He accused Alfred of doing something to the group. You know, he accused him of lying and he demanded real and honest answers. The two guys get into a little fussing match. They get to tussling. Preston threatened to hang Alfred himself. And uh, the two men were eventually separated. And then Alfred, he tells them that, you know what? He's out of here. He is going to leave. He don't need this stress. He's going to pack his things and get, get on out of here because he ain't got time. And got to go now meanwhile while all this is going on five more men from the 20-man group they arrive at the agency the group were introduced to the head of the agency which is general adams and he tells them like hey this guy alfred alfred packer he came through a couple weeks ago and he was a part of you guys' group like do you know him he also tells the group that alfred had been abandoned by his group of, of guys and you know he was deserted how his feet were so cold and frozen and immediately all five men they discredited the story that alfred had told they were like homeboy is a liar i'm sure that's not what really happened he is not to be trusted they said that the men that they knew would have never deserted alfred and moved on without him they recognized the rifle that Alfred had sold them and said that it belonged to an elderly man who would never have just left it behind. The five men convinced General Adams to dispatch an officer to retrieve old Alfred from the neighboring town and bring him in for questioning because they were just like, we need real answers. This is not the truth. We need to know what happened to our men. But they knew that he would try to run if they were honest with him and told him that he was being brought in for questioning and that he was under suspicion. So they lied to him and told him that they were putting together a search party to find his men and they needed him to help. When the officers arrived, Alfred was in the middle of packing his stuff. And uh, he was planning on, planning on getting out of there before Preston whooped that ass. I really like the addition of that color. That did it for me. I like this look now because at first I'm like, Miss Girl, you look a little flat. That coral did it for me. I really like this look now. I'm, I'm, I'm feeling cute now. Now, Alfred, he was reluctant to go because at first he was like, y'all going to do what now? Y'all going to find a man? Okay. Yeah. But he knew that if he did not agree that uh, he might have to face some old vigilante justice, a little old vigilante ass whooping. And so he agrees to go with the officers to help find the group of men that he had set out with. Now, at this point, he had even purchased a horse. He had a whole horse, y'all. A whole horse and a saddle. He got on his little horse and he followed the man back to the agency to help them assemble their search. Now, when he got back to the agency, he was then confronted by General Adams as well as the five new men that had arrived. They confronted him about the fact that when he arrived to both the group and the agency, he had claimed to be penniless, though he had purchased this big old horse, this saddle, and had spent all his money in the town. They also pointed out the fact that he was in possession of a lot of the things that belonged to the five men that had set out with him. Pretty much, they let him know that the jig was up. And they just weren't believing it. They were demanding real hardcore answers and evidence. Now, Alfred, he repeated the story that he had told when he first arrived there. And then he acted all surprised and shocked that the men still had not been found. They had not been heard from. He was like, well, y'all still ain't found them? Oh, my God. He expressed his little concern for their well-being. He was like, we have to find them. They're such good men. But uh, nobody was buying it. Nobody. They all knew that Alfred was full of shit. They asked him, where do you get all this money from? And he said that a man in town had given him a loan. So General Adams, he was like, well, if that's true, then you won't mind me sending one of my officers into town to confirm this. Alfred reluctantly agrees, but he's like, you know what? No, I don't mind. Send him into town to verify my story because I'm telling the truth. A local man loaned me this money. This completely backfired on Alfred because when the officer return not only did he report that nobody in town had offered him or loaned him any kind of money he also had the information that he had arrived with this money and then it was put out that that not only did he arrive with money 
he arrived with money in all these different wallets. At this point, General Adams was like, you know what? We're gonna have to settle this some kind of way. Now, literally during Alfred's interrogation, one of the Native American tribesmen runs into the agency holding strips of dried human flesh that he referred to as white man's meat that he had found on a hill near the agency while he was out hunting. Alfred, he immediately falls to the floor. He begins to sob. He begins begging for mercy and swearing to make a full confession and tell them what really happened while they were out in the mountains if they would just give him a little bit of mercy just a little bit as it turned out old alfred packard had killed and eaten the man claiming that he had to do so for survival he claimed that it would not be the first time that people had been obliged to eat each other when they were hungry now i don't know about you watching this but me, myself i can't see myself eating another person like now i've heard People say that meat is meat and flesh is flesh and flesh is meat. So it's kind of no difference. But for me, it's a difference. I ain't eating no human. I'm just not. I'm so sorry about it. Now, according to Alfred, he said that the men left Chief Alway's camp with what they thought would be sufficient food for the 14 days that they said it would take to get to where they were going. But he said that they were forced to eat more because the travel was so strenuous and so they had to eat more and so they rations, they went down quicker than anticipated. He said that the group of men had survived for days on roots that they dug from the ground and pine gum from the trees, rosebuds, and the occasional rabbit. After a few days of no wildlife activity, nothing to shoot down and hunt and roast over an open fire due to like the extreme cold I guess you know when it's too cold even the animals ain't coming through he said that at this point the group had been surviving on nothing but roots okay nothing but roots that they had dug from the ground and that they were really hungry and it was just getting bad and that they all started to I'm, I don't know why I'm about to laugh because I'm like this is the thing when I first read this he said that they all started to eye each other in an unsettling way my mind went broke back bound and I know that when you hungry and stuff, sex is probably the last thing on your mind. But initially when he said that they began eyeing each other in an unsettling way, I was like, was they about to start busting each other down? Like, what's the deal? But apparently he meant like as food. Now he claimed that a few more days after this, he left the camp to find more firewood. And when he came back, the four men were surrounded around Israel, the older guy who had the rifle. He said that Israel had been struck in the head with a hatchet and that the four men started to butcher swan so they could roast him over the fire and that he he too joined in with them because he had no choice but to accept the situation because he was hungry too so that's what he said happened now he said that several thousand dollars were found in swan's belongings they divided the money between the five of them and decided you know what we, we had to do it we had to alfred claimed that once they had a meal of swan they packed up the remainder of his meat took his rifle and then the group decided to move on like to keep going However, within two days, the men were out of meat again, allegedly. They still had trouble coming upon any kind of game. There was no wildlife in sight. And so Alfred, Shannon Bell, George Noon, and James Humphrey decided in secret that Frank Miller would be the next to go, which is the guy that uh, Alfred was always fighting. They said, you know what? We're going to get him next. He's going to have to take one for the team and we gonna eat him. According to Alfred, they picked Frank because he was a chubby man, he was a stocky man, and they felt like he had a lot more meat. Which the thing is, sir, he just had a lot more fat, but I don't know, maybe he did have more meat, I don't know. But they figured that, you know, he would be their best option to get them a little further. They attacked Frank the same way they had attacked Israel in the head with a hatchet and butchered him and roasted him, packed up his meat and decided, you know what, we gotta keep moving. Now, Frank's money along with his share of Israel's money, it was divided amongst the four surviving men. They took from him his knife and everything else that they wanted, allegedly. And then they decided to move on. Now, the winter was relentless. Homegirl was out here like the and she was not letting up. She wouldn't make life no easier for them. In fact, she was making it a lot more hard, just like Miss Rona and these damn geese. Now, Alfred, Shannon, and George decided that next, old James Humphreys was going to be sacrificed for the good of the group and the good of his meat. Child, I just can't. 
And then from there, they decided to sacrifice George. I'm just telling you how Alfred said things happened. Now we're down to just Alfred and Shannon Bell, who according to Alfred, they had made a pact and promised and swore to each other that they would not eat each other. They was going to make it through this. They couldn't have had that much longer to go and that they was just going to, you know, make it out of this thing together. At this point, they had a rifle apiece. They had knives. They had, they had thousands of dollars that they had gotten from the other guys. Alfred said that they agreed that they would tell the story that the other four men had perished due to the winter, that they just couldn't make it. They had died and they were forced to leave them behind and they would omit the fact that they ate them. Okay. Because, of course, that would be frowned upon and that's nasty. They felt that no one would ever believe that it was necessary for them to do what they had done. Like, they said that they would tell people that they gave them a good old dignified burial and that that was it. Now, unfortunately for them, they did have some way to go. And so after a few days, they were now again out of meat. There was no game around for hunting. He said that they came upon a lake and they decided to set up camp there. And they stayed there for a couple of days. But then out of nowhere, while the two men were sleeping, Shannon Bell jumps up from his blanket and starts to scream that he just can't take it anymore. He allegedly tells Alfred that one of them is going to have to go and be the food. Alfred said that Shannon grabbed his rifle and dashed toward him in an effort to hit him. And so he was left no choice but to attack Shannon Bell back. He hits Shannon in the head with the hatchet. And then he claimed at this point, the only fear he had was to starve to death. And he was like, you know what? Why let this good old meat go to waste at this point? It's like, he had no choice. So he then butchers Shannon Bell and he has himself a good old meal and he packs the remaining portions of Shannon away to prepare himself for the rest of his journey. Of course, he takes Shannon's share of the money. So he really rich at this point. He decided he was going to head on from that point. Not sure how far he was from anything or if he survived it all in the end. After a short while, he climbs his hill and over the hill he sees the agency. He throws the remaining strips of Shannon Bell's flesh away, presuming that an animal would, would eat it. What animals, sir? If you said there wasn't no animals out there, what animals did you assume were going to eat this flesh? See, I need to be a prosecutor because I got the questions. It's going to expose that ass. Why well, I had one question anyway. He also confessed that he had become quite fond of the tastes of humans at this point and that he was particularly fond of the portion surrounding the breast. And it's like, sir, it's chicken breast out here. It's turkey breast you can be eating out here, but you want to eat human flesh breasts like i don't understand as good as chicken is now one of the men was ready to beat him up they was ready to, to just really light into old alfred right they was really gonna give alfred the business but the general he stepped in and he said that they needed to think about their next course of action and so they separated everybody and decided you know let's just have a let's just have a little sit down and discuss how we want to how we want to deal with this now the man from the original group they didn't believe alfred's story one bit they decided though that they would assemble a search party and go out there and try to find the men and that Alfred would lead them to the means. General Adams, he asked some of the men if they knew of the area that Alfred had spoke of. They claimed to have been familiar with the area that he described which was the site that him and Shannon Bell had set up camp at. And they said that it was roughly 50 miles away from the agency. So they all got together, headed that way. But as they got close to the site, Alfred, he suddenly acted like he was lost and confused. And he wasn't quite sure which way to go at this point. And so, of course, this pissed everybody off again. And they accused him of being a liar and a murderer. And they were asking the general to just to allow them to just hang him right then and there. Nothing was found. No bodies were found. And they decided to just head back to the agency. But on their way back, Alfred out of nowhere lunges and attempts to attack Herman Lauder, which was a clerk that worked at the agency out of nowhere. Like they didn't have any kind of beef or nothing. He just, he just pulled one of these acts that the geese did and tried to jump down on little Herman. Now he was caught in the act and restrained. And up until this point, General Adams actually was willing to believe Alfred a little bit, at least give him the benefit of the doubt. Then when this happened, this unwarranted attack, he was like, you know what? No, nah, Alfred, you're a little crazy and you are dangerous. So you can't really be trusted like that. When they got back to town, the agency didn't really have the means to detain Alfred. So they sent him to that little town that he had been living his best life in. And they had them lock him away while they tried to figure out what they were 
were going to do with him. During his detention, he retracted the whole first story about what had happened and why he had to eat them. He claimed that a strong blizzard came through and the group had got lost and they were forced to eat their shoes to survive and whatever edible vegetation that they could find. And then the men entered a pact that if one of them died, then they would eat that one and sacrifice him for food and everybody agreed that if they died they will become the food and the first one to die was the old man he just couldn't take it and so they ate him and then that's what happened people would fall ill and then die and then they would eat him except he maintained the fact that when it got down to him and shannon shannon just went crazy on him and he was forced to kill shannon and eat him so the following august all of the snow melts down alfred is still being detained in this little town or so they think. An illustrator who worked for a Harper's Weekly magazine stumbled upon the site of the incident and of course all the snow had melted so he was met with a real nasty grizzly scene which he actually illustrated and drew. Y'all know I don't put real crime scene photos into these videos but here's the illustration of what he found. He discovered all five of the bodies two miles southeast of Lake City, Colorado in a pine shaded ravine known now as Dead Man's Gulch, which matched the description of where Alfred had originally claimed that Shannon Bell had met his end. But not all five of the men. He said that this is where Shannon exploded on him. Now everybody else was supposed to have passed a long way. The local coroner and a group of some of the law enforcement, they set out to go check out the scene and they find all five bodies at different stages of composition, you know, due to like the elements and wildlife coming by. Y'all know, apparently there's some eyeball eating bambies out here in these streets, so allegedly. Frank Miller's head was missing completely. Now they assumed that some wildlife had come by, picked up his head and carried it off, but I think that Alfred did something to him because, you know, that's the one that he just didn't get along with. So it's like, no, nah, he probably did something with the head himself. I think that's just my own two cents. It ain't facts. Frank and Israel's bodies were pretty much nothing more than bones at this point. But they could tell that Israel had been hit with the hatchet as Alfred had said because there was a huge chunk missing out of his, his skull. The bodies of George and James... Their torsos were skinned and attached to skeletal legs, like all of the meat from their legs had been taken. Their heads were attached, their faces were completely bare, facial hair, full beards, head full of hair, all of that head looked perfect. Except for the fact that they had received blows to the head, which is how Alfred had killed them. And their bodies had noticeably broken bones, so I don't know what that was about, but it was some violence there some kind of way. Now Shannon Bell's body, his torso was completely intact and skinned, but his legs were skeletal. All the meat had been removed from his legs and mostly his arms and his hands were still there, but they were skinned as well. His face was in almost perfect condition. All his hair was there. His beard was there. Just His face was just like completely unscathed. His lack of decay suggested that he was in fact the last to die. Now the top of his head had been ripped open and his, his old brains were laid out underneath his head. So he had been attacked pretty gruesomely. Now with all five men together in one spot, of course this completely contradicts the story that old Albert had told. Both stories actually that he had told that along the way one by one they had perished it's like nah the men did have some torn pieces of clothes that were wrapped around their feet and all of their shoes were missing so they assumed that that part about them eating their shoes might have been true because where were the shoes unless they used them for a fire i don't know but this is the thing i think i'd rather eat my clothes than my no nah, because i don't want to be cold but how do you walk on ice and snow i ain't trying to do that i wouldn't have ate my shoes i'm sorry i couldn't have i don't think i could have i would have ate some damn tree bark no nah. I don't even like them little weedy cereal. So I couldn't have ate no tree bar. I don't know what I would have done. I probably would have ate lettuce off the trees before I ate my shoes. So sorry. Nearby this little site, there was a little makeshift shelter that they assumed Alfred had used to, you know, stay in for a while. And there was evidence inside this shelter that suggested that these killings had taken place before they even completely ran out of rations because some were found inside the little makeshift shelter. Within the shelter, there were also the rest of the belongings from the men. Now the theory at this point is that Alfred killed the men before they ran out of supplies with the intent to rob them 
of their possessions and move on. But then he got snowed in and had to make this makeshift shelter and stay there for a couple of months. And being there for the couple of months, he decided, you know what? I'm about to eat these people because they're not going nowhere, no way. They said they would leave the shelter and slice off meat as needed and return to the shelter and put the little flesh over an open fire. And uh, yeah nasty. Preston, he went to identify the bodies. They gave all of the men a nice proper burial and then they proceeded to go confront Alfred. But then when they got down to where Alfred was supposed to be held, Alfred was gone. There was no Alfred nowhere. Now the townspeople were reportedly unhappy about paying taxes just to be able to house and feed this man who had done these horrible things and they were complaining about it. And so some kind of way he escaped. They don't know if someone helped him. They don't know if the guards helped him or if he was just crafty enough to get out of there on his own. But whatever the case, he was missing. Nine years later, Alfred Packer was discovered living under the alias of John Schwartz in Wyoming. He was recognized by one of the 20 men that he had originally set out on the expedition with. Homeboy alerted the authorities pronto, and so charges were brought up against him. At that point, he signed a confession stating that he had left the campsite to go gather supplies, and while he was gone, all five of the men had killed each other. He came back, and that's just how they were. And so he decided he was just going to take his supplies that he had gathered and uh, weather this terrible storm in the little piece of shelter, and that he ain't had no parts in what happened. He went to trial. He lost. He was sentenced to death by hanging, but he never got the opportunity to be hung. The Colorado Supreme Court, they overturned his conviction, and they, they reduced it to manslaughter and gave him 40 years instead of death. In 1901, he was paroled, and from there, he went to work at the Denver Post, which that's a job he held until he died. He died at the age of 65 from dementia. And uh, at the time, he had reportedly become a vegetarian. I guess he said, don't know meat tastes like human meat, and so he don't want it. His story was the inspiration behind the 1999 film Ravenous. I haven't seen it, but apparently it's, it's about him. And also what I find to be very odd and slightly disturbing is that the University of Colorado, they have a dining area named after Alfred Packer. It's called the Alfred Packer Restaurant and Grill. Here's some photos. Like, why are y'all? Wow, who wants to eat there? What are the menu options name? I just don't think I would even trust that or want to eat there. It got his little picture on the pole. I'm like, why would y'all do such a thing? The story is just so weird to me. I don't even know what to think. I don't believe Alfred at all. I want to know what your thoughts are. Let me know down below. Would you eat another human? If you were really in a situation where you were like starving, could you kill and eat another human? Or even if the human died, would you eat? I'd be scared you died of something nasty. Like, what if you died of AIDS? And now I didn't ate your little AIDS legs. Now I didn't ate your little AIDS meat. And now I'm finna die because now I got it. Like, do you believe Alfred? Would you eat at the Alfred Packer restaurant and grill? I want to know what you got to say down below. Sound off in the comments. Also, don't forget to like the video. Don't forget to give me that thumbs up before you go, please. Thank you, ma'am. We got to kind of act the haters, girl, because they're going to come through with thumbs down for sure. But anywho, that is it. As always, thank you so much for watching, and I will see you in the next one. Peace.